Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. We believe life is about how we react. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. In early April, we moderated a virtual patient panel with Amicus Therapeutics. It included people in three different locations around the world, and all Amicus employees and their families were invited to join. This was just a few weeks into the stay-at-home and social distancing guidelines, and despite global isolation, Amicus continues connecting their staff with patients and their company's mission, and we were honored to be a part of this event. If your company or organization is interested in continuing to build cohesion and momentum, we can help. Visit twodisableddudes.com or email us at thedudes at twodisableddudes.com. We'd love to connect. For now, enjoy the episode. Welcome. Uh, We're very happy that you could all join us this morning, this afternoon, for our conversation with some very special people as we look into the issues that we're all facing with COVID-19. Coping in an uncertain world may be something that feels very recent, very new to most of us. However, for people living with rare diseases, in many cases, unfortunately, uncertainty is part of their everyday lives. And having to practice some of the things that we're just learning about, like social distancing and self-isolation and uh, the anxiety that can go along with that, again, is something that people living with rare diseases experience sometimes on an all too regular basis. So we're so, so appreciative that our guests have joined us today. While they will each introduce themselves a little bit more during the course of the panel, I just wanted to thank Naomi, who's joining us from the UK, to Mike, who's joining us from New Jersey, and to Karen and David joining us from Arizona. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to John for a couple of comments, and then in turn, he will introduce us to our moderators who are now, I think, very much a part of the Amicus family, the two disabled dudes, John and Kyle. John and Eileen. And Eileen, yes, hi everybody. Uh, So Team Amicus, what a great way to end what's been now our third week of working in this new environment. And as we've always traditionally had these lunches and learns, I guess the purpose has been to educate and to inspire. And Kyle and Sean, it's great to have you guys back with us. You guys are certainly now part of Team Amicus and part of the fabric of of this place. And uh, especially pleased and honored to have Naomi and Mike and uh, David and Karen to join us as well. So we're uh, Crowley families eager to listen and learn as well. Our Megan is uh, down the hall actually taking an online class since her courses in her master's program have moved online for this semester, Uh, but she's hoping to sneak out of class for a little bit. And when I told her that the two disabled dudes were doing this for Amicus, and she said, well, then one disabled girl will need to watch, so. (laughs) Anyway, welcome, Kyle, Sean. I'll turn it to you guys. Thank you so much, John, and uh, everybody at Amicus. We're honored to be here. So everyone is at home and in quarantine right now, and we're all concerned about each other. And the two disabled dudes, we want to make sure everybody is getting what they need. But we also need to make a buck. So we're going to start with a little auction. Our first item is the highest quality organic homemade two ply two disabled dudes brand toilet paper. 
And we'll start the bidding at $11. As always, Kyle and I are happy to be here. We want to go ahead and get started. But, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, John, your camera is still on? And it looks like maybe you're taking cash for Friday a little too far. We're going to need you to put that... Put that shirt back on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> As the CEO, I suppose you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, we're, we're just having some fun here, right? And I think that's what it takes. And that's what we love about working with the Amicus. I think everyone knows how important the work is at Amicus. But also, nobody takes themselves personally too seriously. So thank you for doing what you do. As always, Kyle and I count it an honor to not only chat with Team Amicus today, but also moderate the panel with some incredible individuals. So we'll kick it off with them, if you don't mind. Let's start with Michael. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself for everybody to understand? who you are. To start off, I'm, I'm married for it'll be 18 years next month, and I have a 17-year-old son, junior in high school. That's my life at home. Um, my my world changed probably in the early 90s. I started feeling the effects of Pompeii disease, though I had no idea what it was. Uh, misdiagnosed in 98. Nine years, I thought I had probably my osteitis, taking no meds. Um, and then when my uh, breathing got affected, uh, I went to the ER thinking I'd be home in a couple of hours with a prescription and came back home four years, seven months later. So that's uh, with a correct diagnosis. Correctly diagnosed in 2007 with Pompeii. And my it's a new new normal for me for the last oh, for the last I guess uh, 13 years since I went into the ER. So got home 2011 with a diaphragmatic pacemaker, makes my diaphragm work the way it should. So I do not need to stay on the ventilator. So I'm on it now. Um, so I'm sitting right next to it, but um, I can be off for hours. Uh, driving again. Um, it's just a new normal. I mean, there's no walking. I can't walk, uh, although I can transfer from um, bed to chair and vice versa. And uh, But uh, there's no walking anymore. That's done. So, um, so this is my life. This is uh, what I've been uh, getting used to. Well, Michael, thank you for sharing of course, we're going to dig into so much of everybody's story, but I am glad that you're home and we're able to see the walls of your house behind you and not the walls of some other That's for sure. That's place. for sure. Waking up in a hospital room for all those years. And then when I got home, it was like, <laughs> it, was, it was strange, actually, seeing my house. I can't imagine. Naomi, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, I'm Naomi. Um, I am 20 years old. I was, um, I'd always, like, you know, um, had symptoms, like, particularly of um, pain and um, the, um, other symptoms associated with Fabry disease. And um, I'd uh, like, spent my whole life um, being told that, oh, uh, you, you know, you're, you're making it up to get attention. You're faking it so you can get time off school. And um, the thing is that after like years of being told this by people that you know um, much more um, educated than a young child, um, you kind of start to believe it. Uh, oh, maybe I am kind of faking it without intending to. So um, you know, when, when I was diagnosed, it came as a shock, not for the um, thinking about what the future meant, but more on the thing of, a, huh, wow, I guess I was right. And um, so it completely changed the way that I saw myself and um, that um, how other people saw me. It felt kind of 
vindicating. And so, yeah, it, it, it taught me to believe in myself and, you know, to not let others get you down. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think it speaks to the power of how we all see ourselves, right? Like everyone can learn from that story. Um, I, I love it. Thank you. And Karen and David, we will kick it over to you guys. Thanks, guys. Um, Karen and I have twin 10-year-old daughters. They just turned 10. They're our only two children. Um, Amelia and Mackenzie are their names. And in uh, early 2017, right before their seventh birthday, they were diagnosed with juvenile batten disease, uh, both of them. And uh, we're, we're three years into that journey and learning learning about it every day. Um, you know, they went from normal, happy, happy-ish children um, to now that they're they're both uh, they both completely lost their vision. Uh, they uh, had dealt with seizures quite a bit, but thankfully we're about a year seizure-free due to some wonderful medicine. Um, they suffer from pretty significant dementia, which uh, really makes days both challenging and humorous based on what they're talking about. Um, they have a lot of behavior issues, uh, sleep, pain. pain. Yeah, I mean, you name it. Unfortunately, Batten is a uh, all too systemic of a of a disease and, and it affects everything um, sometimes at the same time. So, um, yeah, we're just uh, living one day at a time, one moment at a time and uh, trying to provide them with as many smiles as possible throughout the days. Beautiful. Thank you. Karen and David, I think we're going to stick with you guys for one second. When we were preparing for this, you talked about the challenges of visiting with others and, and inviting people into your home. And that is maybe not an issue right now, right? But can you talk about how you've navigated the curiosities of friends and family through this journey with, with rare disease? It, it's been a challenge to, first of all, deal with for us to process the disease <clears throat> and then also, I guess, take on um, the outside influences and people wanting to spend time with the girls and also what's in the best interest of them sometimes. I think as they have lost their vision, they are much more comfortable being at home, which is understandable. We go to familiar places, but in general, um, they just find being at home where they can still navigate our house just easier, obviously. So it really has forced um, us to always, you know, for a while now to really be isolated into our house. And that means that if people want to see the girls, they have to come over. But it is a challenge. Part of the disease, they have extreme social anxiety. And so just having all that activity in, in their world now is just hearing so and feeling. So. Um, the more noise and chaos that's in the house, even though it may not seem chaos to, to a typical person, it's it's very overwhelming. So we've learned over the years and we're still struggling and we're still learning, but we have to advocate for them. Even if loved, one wants, loved ones want to come over and spend time with them, it's just it's not that typical, you know, grandparent, grandchild relationship, even though they they want it to be. Um, so it's it's tough for us to balance that, um, you know. Stay away for our children's sake, even though we know you love them and they love you, but it's just it's not what's best for them. So, you know, in a very, very strange way, the 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 guarantee of not being able to have people come over is is kind of a nice stress reliever for us. So we don't have to deal with that um, uncomfortable dynamic of telling loved ones to, you know, maybe now's not a good time. There's a lot yeah, of guilt yeah. that comes in with it and having to, to shut people out and it's in the girl's best interest, but then it's, we still struggle with our decisions. I appreciate hearing that because especially right now, the entire world is concerned about congregating and visiting and, and being close with people and hearing your perspective, I, I think you're the first people I've ever heard say right now is actually a bit of a stress relief. There's there's a bit of a built-in excuse or reason, if you will, to uh, 
to not have to worry about the anxieties that this are so easily caused for their girls. Right. Yeah. Kind of a bittersweet time. And that, that may, the longer we stay at home, I'm sure that that feeling will, will flip the other way, but, <laughs> but, you know, we try to look at the positive of in every moment because there's not many of them throughout the day for us. So we got to latch on to those and hold on tight. Absolutely. Naomi, we've got a question for you. Okay. <laughs> How, you know, you talked about being young and your whole life, doctors and people in medicine and different authority figures would give you a hard time thinking that you were faking it, that you were pretending that you just wanted to be off of school. First, are you enjoying time off from school right now or no? Huh. Uh, no, um, I mean, I'm, I'm homeschooled, actually, so um, a lot of it's pretty um, the same. And so in a way, that's kind of um, made me quite well prepared for something like this, because um, I'm so used to doing research myself and, you know, being told by teachers. Um, so this is what uh, we're going to talk about next um, next lesson. Just have fun with it. And um, <laughs> there's a lot of freedom in that. And um, it does teach you things like how to um, discipline yourself and get yourself motivated. And um, so what I find works for me in um, terms of things like that is, uh, um, you know, to do sort of like like work for 20 minutes and then have like a 20 minute break so that you don't get too absorbed into it. And um, so, yeah. But, yeah, it is um, hard, you know, um, like the whole um, feeling of being told, oh, you're faking it. And, um, in a, in, you know, in a way that, you know, the diagnosis was a huge positive, um, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, I totally agreed with um, you know what I said earlier of the whole um, finding the positive in everything, and that even if it's as small as that, oh, but it was sunny today, and I was able to look out my window. That's so good, or you know, um, you're able to read a book or a chapter or anything. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit more, Naomi, about. The years when you mentioned being young and mm. people not believing you, how did you navigate that season? Or actually, I guess more appropriately, how did you get to a point where people really began to give you some credit and believe you? Was it only once a diagnosis came or were there other things that you were able to do? to help people understand what you were up against? So, yeah, um, when I was about 13, so um, three years after I was diagnosed, um, I, um, so, um, I've always been really into kind of writing stories um, and um, just like, you know, kind of writing little comics when I was really young. And um, so I was, um, you know, always struggling with teachers going, um, yeah, um, so I get you've been diagnosed with this, but it's not that bad. You know, you can still do your homework and um, things like that. And um, so I decided to write a story about what it felt like when I was in so much pain, I couldn't get out of bed. And um, it was so intense, I couldn't even watch TV because following the plot line was so exhausting. And um, and that wasn't even like a really complicated show. And so I wrote a story about it and I took it into school and gave it to my um, teachers and um, they were so affected by it. Some of them were crying, actually, which I was a bit sort of like, I don't know why you're crying because I was a kid. And um, but after it, they, they completely changed in their attitude towards me, they um, were more understanding and um, they um, realised even if I um, didn't you know, get the homework in by the time it was due, I, I would still get it done and I'd still understand what was behind it. So, yeah, it felt really vindicating and powerful to see how um, something that I created, um, something that I did could change the world, could change my situation. Yeah, I think that also speaks to uh, the way we communicate to each other. You were speaking their language, right? Like 
you were trying to communicate, I I gather, um, for years, and it wasn't getting through. But it, when you started speaking their language, you wrote this story. That's what really turned them on. And I think that's something that we all need to keep in mind in everything we do, the different ways we communicate in, and, uh, you know, taking our audience into in to the situation and figuring out how best to communicate to that audience. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to move on to Mike, but I also want to recognize that there are 250 attendees right now. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and it's also awesome that, that we don't see everyone. It's a really cool feeling to just have a, a conversation here. Um, but I also want to recognize all of the family members of the Amicus employees that are joining us. Um, that 253 is probably a lot more than that because of people watching over shoulders and who are really interested in what their loved ones do for a living. So appreciate you guys being on, on the broadcast. Mike, um, there's there's an obvious question, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you said you were in the hospital for five years. Just that? about, yeah. yeah. Four years, seven months to be exact. So we're all up against this thing. We have no idea when it's going to end. Um, I, I think we're all hopeful that it will end soon. Um, but we really mm -hmm. have no idea. And so I... I can't help but draw the parallel between our situation right now and when you were in the hospital. Um, I, I definitely yeah. don't want to minimize it at all, but um, how, how did you mentally handle just the uncertainty of when the heck right. am I going to get out of here? Am I ever going to get out of here? Just day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Um, Actually, for the first two and a half years, I was in no shape to go home. Uh, so, yeah, I knew I couldn't go home yet. Um, I, I had various tests done on me. Uh, I went to, uh, I switched hospitals because uh, I heard this one doctor said, you don't need a trach. You, you, you shouldn't have it. So, I, it got me excited. So, I, I, I had myself transferred over to this hospital in Newark, New Jersey. and um, but then, and now, at this point, I was on the, the ventilator 24-7 for like two and a half years. And so when, like, when I got there, within 30 minutes, he took it out. No trick, nothing. And I was okay for a while. But then I, um, I, I had a plug or I couldn't breathe. Um, and they, I think they intubated me and then put the trach back in. And then about a week later, he says, well, let's try this again. Again, I was out. I, I, I was I took a trach out, and um, I was good for a while. And again, same thing happened. Couldn't breathe. And, and it was bad, too. It wasn't just, like, you know, it was bad. So uh, I put the trach back in. The doctor said, this is a month later, he says, well, I guess you do need the trach. <laughs> you think? So... Uh, I transferred back to the hospital I was in, and they probably said, I told you so, but whatever. Um, uh, so, but after about maybe about three years, I was feeling good. I was ready to go home, and I had doctors tell me, no, you, you, you're never going to be going home. You're not going to go home. Well, that's all they had to tell me. Um, when I heard that, I was more determined than ever. And then... Uh... And then Jane, uh, with John's blessing, emailed me, not thinking they ever knew I existed. And they said, all right, we're going to see what we can do. And boy, my spirits were lifted. You won't believe how good I felt. And from then on, we worked on getting home. You Beautiful. Know, Mike, I'm curious, hearing you tell the story that much detail i'm wondering how you or anybody really we can open this up after michael answers but i feel like going back and forth between a trick no trick 
trade, no trade. I, I, I feel like in the moment, I would almost feel like we're taking a step backwards in my care. And I know that it would be a challenge to accept that mentally and emotionally. And that m may even impact the hope I feel overall. So I wonder, Michael, can you speak to a minute about how the ups and downs of your journey have impacted your mental state or even your your hope at all, if it has? Well, uh, when this doctor told me, I was on the phone with him before I transferred. When he told me, you don't need to take your have it out and, and you'll be you don't need it. Well, my hope was huge. I mean, I'm like, wow, this is going to be great. I get home and not feel most the way I was. But then when it didn't work, of course I was down. Um, but um, to tell you, I, I'm comfortable on the on the vents. I mean, normal breathing, I wish, which I didn't have for years uh, before I was straight. So I was comfortable on the vent. Um, but I, well, I still had hope that I'd, I'd be able to get off it, but I was starting to realize probably not. Uh, but then, um, when I, um, heard about, I heard about a diaphragm pacemaker from one of the respiratory therapists at the hospital I was in. And I said, wow, that'd, that'd be great. But it took me a year later, a year after that to actually really try to contact doctors about it. I actually sent an email out to the Pompeii community, which consists of not only people with Pompeii, but their uh, parents, guardians. And uh, one of the uh, parents of a Pompeii child got back to me. He's in Florida. He told me, my son's doctor works with the doctor that developed it. And from then on, I got in touch with the doctor in Florida, John and Jane Noel. Uh, and um, I, I actually, uh, a company down in Florida, a husband and wife team, a nurse, she's a nurse, and I guess he's the driver, uh, drove up to Jersey in an RV, set up with a bed, and picked me up, drove me back down to Florida. And um, we, we, you know, they did a whole bunch of tests on me. Um, and then I had the operation about two months after I got down there. And as I said, uh, now I can be off the vent for hours. It's incredible to hear the support that you were able to connect with just Big from time. reaching yeah. out to people. So thank you for Big sharing time. that. Sure. Karen, Karen and David, I'm wondering, um, have you guys experienced any up and down, back and forth. I know when we spoke before this phone call, you talked about, you know, some days are good, some days are bad. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, the way you manage those good days versus the bad days? Quite simply, we laugh on the good days and we cry on the bad days. I <laughs> know. Awesome. Uh, true. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. oversimplified. Um, you can chime in whenever you want, but you know that unfortunately, um, that disease is a pretty steady downward path. So there's there's not a heck of a lot of ups and downs other than the the micro of of the daily um, smiles or or crying. But um, you know, so it's more it's more plateaus. Kind of a word from our uh, our grief counselor that we hang on to. Um, there's always these these downhill slides, and then things seem to level off for a little bit before the next one. So, in a weird way, those plateaus are kind of highs for us, even though they're just kind of a, a temporary new normal before the next dip. And those always bring anxiety too, because it's always it's sad that even when we're in a really great moment, you question when is it going to end. You get you mm. can only enjoy it so much because you're really thinking in the back of your mind, like this is going to come crashing yeah. down on us. It's too good to be true. Not sustainable. At the yeah. And then with having the two girls, it's often one is you know in our plateau while the other one feels like plummeting so to have both girls in a good mood or in a plateau is just almost unheard of these days we're always you can enjoy you're kind of trying to laugh with one child while the other one's over here you know 
having their own issues of the moment and they're serious issues. So it's mm. a struggle to, to manage. Yeah. We, you know, our, our kind of daily motto is if you're not laughing, you're crying. So we try so hard to laugh. Um, you know, we try to get the girls to laugh. It's kind of infectious and, and we can't break through a lot of the times, but we still try. So, I mean, you know, from a, from a, a small scale coping mechanism, that's, that's what it is. Trying to find the humor, trying to find the, those silver linings, those happy moments. And, um, man, some, some days are really, tough to to find that needle in a haystack but we always look um but you know honestly i mentioned it before but um we we, we started going to a grief counselor less than a week after diagnosis and we're still going today um that's helped us tremendously you know not just deal with our own emotions of what we're going with but dealing with the whole uh uh you know self-isolation and and social distancing and all that so um, that's been huge for us, and we're we're working on it every day. Yeah, I don't know where we would be without that advice. You, you talk about making the girls laugh. I'm curious, are you famous for your dad jokes? Do you have dad jokes, no, or you're no. not that kind of dad? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, but uh, one of our daughters, Mackenzie, is really good at dad jokes. Um, so <laughs> she I, makes up her own. Yeah, she, make, she makes up her own, and they make no sense. But they're quite honestly <laughs> the the funniest jokes because they make everyone laugh because they're just ridiculous. Um, but so you know, I we just encourage her to tell jokes, you know, instead of me telling them. Um, and it's it's great so far. She you know even with the dementia and the difficulty in memory, she. You know, she started telling jokes and learning jokes when she was really little, three or four years old. So that's still stuck in there, which is great. So she can still recall. Sometimes she'll just need like a word or two to to trigger, a, you know, the rest of the joke for her. And then she can go off and tell it. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, but, you know, lots of tickles and just doing silly stuff. You know, I just act like I'm five and then everything seems to work. So. You know, it's not a stretch for me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like yeah. your daughter's jokes take a lot of pressure off of you, right? To come up with good jokes all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. I tell you, Alexa is an, a wonderful tool. She'll, you know, it's kind of a, a good and bad. They don't sleep. And so literally, uh, Mackenzie specifically will stay up all night just talking to Alexa. Tell me jokes. Tell me <laughs> jokes. Tell me jokes. <laughs> and she'll wake up in the morning and tell us, you know, three or four new jokes she learned. I love that. That's, That's awesome. wonderful. <laughs> Naomi, what additional advice might you give to the rare disease community or even just people in general during this really uncertain time? So I'd say that it's um, a good idea to, um, you know, like create small goals. So, um, you know, um, and they can, they can be like, um, you know, do a whole lot of work or as small as, you know, just get dressed, you know, and um, to because just completing even something small can really help with um, self-esteem and knowing that you're not just, you know, it's something that you can use to fight those thoughts that tell you, oh, I'm just sitting around doing nothing. You can say, well, no, actually, I did this, so you're wrong, and um, it makes you feel good. <laughs> also, there's, um, I'd definitely say, um, don't just sit around watching TV all day every day because mm -hmm. that'll get old fast <laughs> and um but you know um, if you're going to do it, have a like a, you know like a movie marathon for one day and then do next day i'm going to do something else and um make a, an event of it and so yeah um but yeah that's pretty much my tips <laughs> not gonna lie naomi you sound more motivated and productive than I do. Yeah. So good on you. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, My... I definitely do have um, low points too, like everyone else. Um, so yeah, I'd also say like to take it easy on yourself if you don't feel mm -hmm. like doing anything. Definitely. <laughs> Mike, same same question to you. What what do you do day to day right now? Um, what advice can you give to others to to keep their spirits up right now? Well, don't think about it. Um, no. um, uh, I have a, I have my routine. 
you know, I'm home. I'm actually home alone a lot, except now that my son's uh, doing remote learning and my wife's home a lot, though she does go into the office a couple of days a week. Uh, but I do have my routine. Um, I, I, I need help dressing. I have to get dressed and helped up. But once I'm in my chair, I, I, um, I listen to music. I do my crossword puzzles, you know, things to keep my mind occupied. Because if, if you're sitting there just thinking, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, I, I can't do that. I have to have, I have to be occupied doing something or else I'm just thinking and not what I want to do. So, uh, I, it's uh, a routine. Getting into routine is not bad. Not a bad thing. Um, but uh, that's pretty much what I do. Um, I, another good thing is, <laughs> excuse me. Good. Take your time. When, when I talk a lot, um, I tend to cough or need to get rid of the uh, congestion. But um, a good thing to do is call people, call my friends. Or, um, uh, I, I, I am on Facebook, but I actually gave it up for Lent. So uh, nice. <laughs> uh, uh, I, actually, I was tired of all the negative political comments, and I had to take a break from that. But um, but I am on there. I either call friends or contact them through social media. And um, it's, it just it gives you comfort, gives you support. And uh, so between music, of course, I'm a big crossword puzzle guy. Crossword puzzles, contacting people. Um, I think that's what keeps me from being down. I love both of those, connecting with your tribe or your community mm. and challenging mm-hmm. your mind or maybe not challenging it, but uh, it, giving it some some stimulation, you know, doing a exactly. crossword puzzle or even a traditional puzzle is probably going to keep your mind sharper help. Exactly. Yes. Karen and David, what about you folks? What kind of advice... You know, whether it be for a, a situation our world is in right now or when it comes to caring for rare disease patients or being a, a family dealing with fatten or something else as challenging and devastating, how in the world do you um, encourage others or even encourage each other to continue moving forward every day? Um, It sounds so simple, but focus on what's important. When the girls were diagnosed, you know, our whole world came crashing down. You have a whole new perspective on life. And like we talked about, just enjoying the simple things in life and those little giggles Mm -hmm. and all the noise of just the the chaos and the hustle and bustle. And, you know, just it, it didn't matter anymore. And slowly, you know, over the past three years, that sort of life has, you know, re-entered and, you know, work came back and we started a foundation. All these things just kind of occupy us. And um, this virus has just kind of brought us back, not the same, but to the very beginning of the girl's diagnosis and slowing it down and remembering, you know, we're just our little family unit and what is important. And also definitely, you know, there's that isolation that came with the diagnosis, which other people are feeling now being, you know, you know, bound to their house. And so it's, it's true. I mean, reaching out to those friends, those little connections, again, just a a small little note to someone can mean so much. And it's not even about the reply. It's just to know that, you know, that person is thinking about you right now. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add a little bit about, you know, acceptance. And I don't mean that in, in the coming and, and just, you know, um, liking it, but you know, with a rare disease diagnosis, like it's it's here, right? It's real. Just embrace it. You know, and like I said, you don't have to accept it. That's there's different definitions of acceptance, but you have to embrace it and 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 move on with that being a reality. And and just like the virus, same thing. Like we're homebound. Okay, just you're homebound. Accept that and figure out a way to to. To wrap your wrap your brain around that new normal, and uh, um, like Michael was saying, I mean, hobbies are great. Learn learn something new. Learn how to paint. Learn how to you got you got time to do some fun stuff um, that you're not going to be able to do once we're back to the rat race. So, 
um, you know, I, you know, I think I speak for Karen and myself and probably most all attendees, hopefully that um, when things do get back to normal, whether it be weeks or months or years from now, you know, I hope we hold on to a good chunk of what today's life is and bring that with us in, in collaboration with, you know, having to earn a living and, and get back to the real world. But, um, you know, priorities are everything like Karen said, just truly take a deep breath and understand your priorities, what's important in life. And that's a little bit different to everybody, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just embrace it and, and try super hard every day to find silver linings, even if they're, you know, super tiny. We are going to move momentarily into a period where we take a few questions from those watching the broadcast at home. In fact, there's already one question. But before we do that, Naomi, I do want to hear from you one more time. I'm curious, in your 20 years, so you said you're 20, right? Yeah. What is your favorite thing in life right now? Whether it be about yourself or about your journey, what is what is a favorite thing to you? Um, oh, that's a hard question. There's so many good things. Like, um, I suppose, um, like being able to, um, you know, write. Um, it, it means so much to me, like reasons I've said already. But, um, you know, also, in that it's not just about um, changing like my situation. It's also about kind of. Um, saying this is how i feel whether it's um good or bad and um expressing it even if all i can write is like um a few words it, it feels good to um not have to bottle it up inside and you know like so often um when you when people like ask you how are you feeling they don't really want you to say oh i'm feeling really rubbish i haven't been able to get out of bed for a while um they want you to say yeah yeah i'm fine and um, it's kind of like everyone expects right. you to lie. Mm, that's right. <laughs> I, Definitely. I, I feel like you have, you share a piece of wisdom every time you start <laughs> to talk. And I love that you, you, you just encourage everybody to be okay with feelings. You know, they, they're legit and they're true. Doesn't mean you have to go be angry at the world, but being, you know, almost like David said, kind of accepting them and finding a way to cope and manage and move on. I love, yeah. I love the way you you share yourself and and what you what you know and what you have experienced. So thank you. Before we jump into question and answers, I want to recognize that um, we've had a few bids on the toilet paper. And it is up to two hundred and sixty dollars. <laughs> and so I think Sean, if if you're okay with this, I want to um I want to take this person up on their two six. Actually, you know what? Let's keep the bids going. But <laughs> what we're gonna do with the money, we're I'm gonna ship you the the toilet paper. And what we're gonna do with the money, we're gonna have Naomi and Karen and David and Michael uh choose the charity they want to donate to. We will split the money in three and uh and get the money to those charities. So keep your bidding going on the chat and um we'll answer some questions. So the first question that we have showing up is actually for David and Karen. The question is, what made you decide to go to a grief counselor? Grief counselor. Um, actually, I think it was a little serendipitous, but Amelia was diagnosed kind of backtracking at two with autism. And then while we were waiting for the Batten diagnosis, she probably four months earlier, we'd been told that she was legally blind. So Dave and I at that point were just struggling with having a legally blind autistic child. And my sister decided to come out to visit just to kind of help. And so she was in town. Um, she arrived Thursday. Fri we got the call from the geneticist to come in Friday morning. So we went in, we're given the diagnosis. And honestly, thank God, my sister was visiting for the weekend because she took care of us and our children that weekend. Um, my sister's in the medical field. And before she left, she had found us a grief counselor. And I don't think Dave and I ever, it was not on our radar, we would have not have done it on ourselves, you know, ourselves. 
but she um, lined it up for us. And so for three years now, we've been going. And it's been huge to us because it's taught us how to deal with our own emotions, how to deal with the outside world, you know, also dealing with the girls, um, teaching us to prioritize ourselves and our relationship so that together we can handle what's happening. Um, and, you know, for us, it's there are only two children. So our entire world came crashing down. And what does our life, you know, like, what is our purpose and what does it mean now? Because, I mean, honestly, there'll come a day when we don't have children anymore. And that obviously was not our life plan. So, sorry. Yeah. But um, it's a big part of, you know, getting us through, yes, the diagnosis. So I'm grateful There's, to my sister for lining that up for us. <laughs> There's another question for you two, and I lost it already, but uh, basically it, they're asking you what you do to decompress. What are, what are some mom and dad activities you do? To, yeah, to we help? tried to, uh, when we were allowed to, we tried to go golfing every week or two, just escape. Um, you know, our therapy evenings have turned into date night. So we go to therapy and then we roll into dinner. Um, we're big game people. I you mean, know, it's we drinking and drugs. No, it's just, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the real medicine. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I'm know, glad like I'm games. not alone. We play cards, we play cards and uh, games. It, watch TV. It, I mean, the typical stuff, honestly, but we just don't get as we don't get to do that as much as we would like. Um, but our therapist has actually um, pushed us to make sure we do it. She, she equates it to um, when you're on an airplane and the oxygen masks drop down, they say, put it on yourself before helping your children. And mm. and that, there's a lot of sense in that, because if if you if we are not strong, we're worse help for our kids. So. We got to take care of ourselves first, not to be selfish, but actually with their best interest in mind. And that was tough in the beginning because there was a lot of guilt because it, it did feel selfish. But then we're obviously it's the whole thing. And we're not our best selves if we don't get that reprieve. So it, it took time to even be comfortable with it's OK to take, you know, six hours today to go play golf. You know, just the two of us. I've got a question for Naomi, but I wanted to recognize that the bid for the toilet paper is up to $510. So I got a message that told me that Amicus would match the bid up to $1,000. So let's, uh, let's see what happens here. And with that, I want to direct an answer or a question to Naomi. Um, it's from Levi Gershkowitz. And um, he asked, what does solidarity look like in the rare disease community right now? And um, I ask you because I imagine that, you know, friendships are a really important part of being 20 years old and people then understand you, right, in connections to the rare disease community. And so what I want to know based on that question is how, how do you see people connecting and and do you – continue to connect with the rare disease community right now uh yeah i do um uh, on social media you know things like facebook and twitter there's a lot of um great groups out there and um it it is um, really useful and um, i think the most important thing right now is things like um just talking to people and saying that question how are you and um you know actually meaning it not as a like i said earlier it's like i don't want you to tell the truth <laughs> and um so yeah um just um talking to people and you know just um connecting with people and saying this is what i'm doing um this is what works for me what works for you and going oh that sounds like a good idea um, i might try that and um you know um i've met um so many people that um i wouldn't have met if i'd never been diagnosed um i've had a completely different um you know life journey and um you know in some ways it's worse but i mean every single life has problems and um in some ways so, so many of the, the things that have happened to me have been so amazing um and um it's 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 good to have made so many good friends and to 
see how although we all um, might live um, with different lives, different symptoms and, um, you know, different um, relationships with other people, um, we do have that kind of um, similarity that makes us um, human, I guess. Um, we all have that feeling. Um, mm. So, yeah. Absolutely. I so agree with that. It's so amazing to connect w human to human on such an intimate level. Like when you connect with someone else in the rare disease community, um, it's it's a connection that you don't experience with anyone else. So, yeah, that's amazing. Very good. Yeah. We are getting close to our time frame. And I see Jane coming back on, subtle way of telling us to stop talking. <laughs> and I, no, Jane, we can probably one more quick question. I, I would love, there is one question that I think everybody could take a quick moment and answer just one piece of advice. What is something, this is coming in from Fran, what is something you tell yourself every day to remind yourself to stay positive despite your circumstances. Naomi, what is something you tell yourself daily or regularly to keep yourself on a, in a positive mindset? When I first wake up, I do this thing that I've um, learned from my mum, where you kind of um, you kind of like get up and just sort of say loudly or shout if you want, um, just "Hello, world." <laughs> and, um, that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Michael, do you have any strategies for keeping your mind in a in a good spot? Well, I have a seventeen year old son that um he was the reason I fought to get out of the hospital. He was four years old when I went in and he was eight years old when I got out. So I missed ah. I mean I was in touch with him every night on camera, but obviously that's not the same as living with him. And um and they, him and my wife came on weekends, of course. But I miss those four years. Those are big years for for a kid and for a father. So uh, I just think I got to be tough for him. I got to be happy for him. And uh, that's what keeps me going. Keep keep your loved ones in mind. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. All right, Karen and David, do you have anything to, to share? I think it's... Like Dave said before, the silver linings, it, for me, every morning is trying to focus on what there is positive in our life, even with everything with the girls. Um, I'm grateful for our family, our support. I'm grateful that Dave and I have an amazing relationship still. I mean, that um, I can't imagine doing this without him. So just the, the small positives that they're huge positives, but, you know, those little things that keep us going every day. If I can just comment, Eileen and I, I, similar to that, Karen, you used the word grateful. That's something we've we've always tried to think about, and even now in this crisis, uh, to just always be grateful. And uh, the other part is, you know, to remind ourselves that <clears throat> no matter what the challenge may be, most often it could always be worse. When Megan was little and we were getting the kids ready for school, and it was crazy in the house in the morning. We had this routine. I'd be getting ready in the bathroom, shaving and, and putting the tie on or whatever. Megan would come zooming in in the wheelchair, and I asked her the same question every day um, when she was a little girl, Megan, how are you? And for years and years, she would answer with the same one word. No matter what the weather was, no matter what the pressure was at school, if she had a cold, the same one word, she would say, awesome. I'm awesome. But so much of that is wow. attitude. Right. Absolutely. He's now learned to put a lot of colorful adjectives in the word awesome. But <laughs> Each of you is awesome in your own way, for yourselves, for your families, but really for your communities and for all of us. So we appreciate you sharing so honestly and your insights. Uh, I also think that we, in this time, we do have to be grateful. We do have to remember. The little things, uh, what we often call, and thanks to Naomi and her mom, are good stuff. And we'll be uh, pushing out some things to help families. Uh, and I, I hope that everybody found this conversation as inspirational. I wish everybody blessings. Uh, stay well, stay happy and healthy, 
and stay connected, stay at home, and wishing everybody a great weekend, and we'll be in touch with you all soon. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Stay, stay safe. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you all. Yes. Oh, bye. Yes. I think it's incredible that we can stay connected with people all over the world right now. Even though we can't meet face to face or even touch our own face. (laughs) (laughs) We're grateful for Amicus and their commitment to people around the globe. Thank you to Naomi, Michael, Karen, and David for joining us and sharing your wisdom. And thank you for listening today. Until next time, keep living with urgency. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Find us online at twodisableddudes.com and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Special thanks to our friend and audio producer, Jake Tompkins.